It is the 12th of February 2017, and some 180,000 people are receiving some terrible news. They have to leave their homes. But it's not due to war or anything like that, but the source of their electricity and drinking water. No, there isn't some kind of mass wiring slash plumbing issue, but it is the source of the power itself that is threatening their homes. You see, the residents are from parts of Butte, Yuba and Stutter counties in California, all of which are situated along the Feather River Basin. A part of the Oroville Dam upstream is threatening to collapse, leading to a period of time called the Oroville Dam Crisis. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today's video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. As always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. The Dam So like all Dam videos, we've got to go back to the beginning. And that is the construction of a new water holding back structure aka me in the bath, or in less technical terms, a dam. So we go back to 1960 and the beginnings of the California State Water Project. This was a massive undertaking to provide reliable water to Southern California. Part of the project was to build multiple new pieces of infrastructure, and one massive key in this statewide water system was a dam. Not just any dam, but the tallest dam in the United States. It would hold back and create the Oroville Reservoir and provide a readily available power source for the Edward Hyatt power plant. Anywho, construction of the dam began in 1957, with railway tracks operated by Western Pacific Railroad being removed. Before the dam's footings were built, extensive site surveys were undertaken, involving core drillings and mappings of the region. Running between 1961 and 1962, two diversion tunnels were built to take the Feather River flow away from the dam site. In 1963, the concrete core was built into which the remaining dam would be constructed, which was to be of an earthen fill embankment type. A lot of time, effort and ultimately money went into the design and build of the dam and the power station. All great stuff. However, not the same amount of energy went into the plans for a vital part of any project of this type. That is, of a spillway. You see, spillways are a vital cog in the machine that is a dam and its reservoir. They are intended to safely release excess water from, say, floods or heavy rain, causing the reservoir to fill up. The dam actually has two spillways, an emergency one, which was intended to provide overtopping relief, and the main spillway. Water could also be discharged via the hydroelectric power station and the river outlet valve. Anywho, the main spillway or service spillway is located on the right abutment of the main dam when looking downstream. It has an unlined approach from the reservoir where a gated headwork structure is situated. After the gatehouse, water flows down a chute. This is a 179 feet wide by over 3000 feet long concrete works. It was a made of multiple slabs of concrete poured over steel reinforcement, founded directly onto the rock. The rock foundation varied in quality from solid weathered all the way down to loose soil-like rock. This would prove later to be an inconsistent place for foundations. The slab was anchored to the rock using steel rods. The slab had a minimum thickness of 15 inches, however this was reduced over drainage areas. So the whole project was completed in 1968, but the spillway wouldn't see its first use until a year later in 1969. Over the years the spillway would be used, which under the great power of the water flows would require a number of repairs to the chute slabs. Most notably in the years of 1977, 1985, 1997, 2009 and 2013. Damage to the spillway came in the form of expansion joint damage, delamination, slab cracks and spalling. Repair work would involve patching up the damaged area, which over time would too lead to extra wearing down. Now before we get to the crisis, I have to mention that in 2005 the project underwent relicensing. This raised some concerns about the emergency spillway. It was unlined and thus was just a slope. 
If used, the flow of water could cause significant erosion and thus damage to the local area. Pressure groups posited that the emergency spillway could be lined with concrete, which would reduce damage if used. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission didn't add the requirement for the emergency spillway to be lined during its licensing. And this would come back to bite the dam later, which brings us on to the crisis. The crisis. Our disaster begins with a high inflow of water into the Oroville Reservoir at the beginning of February 2017. As the water level rose, operators set about the process of opening the spillway gates to manage the increasing water depth. Between the 6th and 10th of February 2017, 12.8 inches or 330 millimetres of rain had fallen on the Feather River Basin, where 30,000 cubic feet per second of water was flowing into the reservoir on the 6th of February. Normally this is no bother. The spillway could handle this amount of water. However, as the 7th drew in, higher flows into the basin reached 130,000 cubic feet per second. Again, no problem. Just increase the flow along the spillway. Great. Well, operators noticed something rather odd. The slipway had a flow of 52,500 cubic feet per second far below the maximum ever recorded, which was at 180,000. But the odd thing was that the flow of water was looking a little bit off. Water was flowing off the side of the spillway, about a third to a half of the way down. Operators stopped the flow down to the spillway, and a crater was revealed. Parts of the concrete lining had disappeared, and erosion had begun at the failure point. This created a massive rock and hard place situation for the operators. Do they continue using the clearly compromised spillway or allow the basin to fill to the point that it would overtop the emergency spillway, which could potentially cause all the erosion issues mentioned in the 2005 relicensing debacle? They chose to keep on using the main spillway, hoping that a reduced flow rate wouldn't cause that much more damage. The spillway gates were opened on the 9th of February and again water started flowing down. The reduced flow was not enough to reduce the basin water level, and it slowly rose. It was seeming like the water level would overtop the emergency spillway. As such, workers began on the 10th of February cutting away trees and clearing the site to allow for a smoother flow of water down the hillside. The water overtopped the emergency spillway on the 11th, but quickly it was becoming apparent that the weir that was holding the water back was being eroded at its base quicker than anticipated. This was from the water flowing down the hillside below the emergency spillway weir. Some erosion was expected, but not as much as it was happening in reality. Bearing in mind that this was the first time that the emergency spillway had ever been used in the project's history. Now, this was threatening complete failure of the concrete weir, which would release a deadly torrent of water down the Feather River. This was estimated to be a wall of water 30 feet in height. In order to prevent the potentially disastrous release, the main spillway was again pressed into service, blasting water down into the eroded crater. But unsurprisingly, this increased the erosion of the spillway. Fearing a major disaster with the emergency spillway failing, on the 12th of February, an evacuation was ordered for the low-lying areas of the Feather River Basin that ran through Butte, Yuba and Sutter counties to be evacuated. The unfolding brown trouser situation was that of a failed spillway blasting water over the edge which would erode more of the spillway and a, create a huge chance of a major failure of the weir. By the evening of the 12th, the water level was thankfully below the emergency spillway weir. This allowed workers to inspect the damage and to place boulders and undertake temporary shoring up works. There was a real fear though in keeping the flow along the main spillway, where the erosion at the failure site would move backwards towards the spillway gates, which if then failed, would cause an uncontrollable flow of water. By the morning of the 13th, in addition to the boulders, sandbags were dropped from helicopters into the eroded area below the emergency spillway weir. By this time, an estimated 188,000 people had been evacuated, and this is roughly two and a half times the population of the town of Guildford, Surrey. Panic took over the town of Oroville, with, as noted in an NBC News article, it was just panic. People were running in the streets. Cars were speeding through town. 
Over the following days, the water level reduced and shoring up work along the emergency spillway continued. With the catastrophic release of water being averted, the evacuation order was downgraded to an evacuation watch on the 14th of February. With the water at a manageable level, the spillway gates were shut after the 27th of February and the full extent of the damage was realised. Two massive sections of the main spillway had completely been eroded, pushing debris, concrete, soil and rocks into the Feather River. This had reduced the flow from the power plant, which had in turn caused power issues to the residents in the area. The shutting of the spillway gates allowed some of the debris to be removed from the river, which in turn allowed the power station to come back online. To allow repair works, Lake Oroville was kept at a lower level as to negate the need for spillway usage. The repair would continue for over a year, finally being completed in its improved form in November 2018. Although the crisis didn't end up in a NOAA invoking flood, it did cause a localised economy, economic disaster with over $1 billion in damage being caused. And this included debris that was blasted down the river, which had damaged flood levees. Interestingly, the state blocked any class action lawsuit against it, which was upheld in California's third district court of appeals, meaning that any lawsuits against the state, basically the owner of the dam, would have to be brought individually, which makes it much easier for the state to fight. On top of the people, that had to be evacuated, over 9 million fish had to be evacuated as well from the Oroville hatchery. But what was the cause? Well, one massive investigation report would dive into that little chestnut. The investigation. So whilst the disaster was still ongoing, the DWR commissioned an independent board of consultants on the 17th of February to probe into the causes behind the spillway failure. The investigation would go on for nine months, involving an independent investigation panel. The damage was poured over and importantly, the human factors were also considered. Diving into the history of the project showed that issues with the spillway were highlighted as early as the late 1960s. The chute slab wasn't even up to the best practices of construction at the day, which was not having double reinforcement and not very good undershoot drainage. It was also found that the principal design of the spillway was fresh out of university, which led to a lot of errors during the design phase not being picked up, such as no adjustments to the anchor depth for less stable ground conditions. This was not just a design issue, but also an as-constructed problem, where the variability of the foundation material should have caused adjustments to the anchor lengths on site. But it wasn't just down to a couple of people. Such a large project goes through hands of a multitude of numbers, all of whom missed the mark, sadly, upon the altar of cost savings, as mentioned in the independent review. The decision making during the design and construction may also reflect cost pressures, possibly combined with schedule pressures. One indicator of this is that the bid price for the spillway construction was reportedly about 10% below the engineer's estimate. The engineer's plans were seemingly not reviewed to fit the actual site conditions. It is common for modifications to be made along the way when transferring from paper to reality. The project, at least for the spillway construction, didn't review what other spillways on other dams had previously done, creating a situation where best practices weren't considered or even the mistakes of others weren't even learned from. But the disaster didn't happen overnight. For some 50 years of the spillway history was littered with multiple chances to remedy issues. We already know the chute was repaired on multiple occasions. This hints that the concrete was having a few issues. This was due to the foundation quality being poor, but on each five-year review, it was incorrectly identified as good quality rock. Cracking concrete in the chute slab was considered normal and just patched up. However, as the years went on, these cracks would allow for reinforcement deterioration, which in turn weakened the concrete further. Just filling in the cracks doesn't really fix this, and it is quite literally the same as wallpapering over the cracks in a house. It doesn't fix the cause. So on the 7th of February 2017, the mechanics of the failure were water finding its way into the concrete chute slab via joints and cracks. This caused an uplift of the slab, which not being properly anchored resulted in localised failures and eventual crater and erosion hull. Once the hull was created, 
further erosion took place, which ultimately resulted in further concrete slab failure. The disaster, although being a mechanical failure, was ultimately a very common one on to this channel. That is of a human nature. Missing the warning signs and carrying on as normal until the whole show explodes. Now that's my video on the Oroville Dam failure. It's going to be a 2 on my scale, but it has to be a 9 for those who had to evacuate in fear of their lives. And this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a plenty of foot video. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plenty of videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite nice corner of Southern London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and Mr. Music, play us out, please.